Bring us up to speed, though, since that really famous TED Talk, like, what does your life look like now? The case I was trying to make is, why is Africa still the poorest region in the world? In terms of how easy or hard it is to start a company, you tell me why African countries, all 50 of them, are basically at the bottom of that list. Despite having some of the greatest riches in the world, do you know what it, what it is for others, Kevin? For others, it is, you pack yourself into little fishermen's boats. <laughs> trying to cross to somewhere in Spain and oftentimes that boat tips on the ocean. Or do you called it at one point people are turning into fish food? Yeah, basically we are still still serving as fish food. That's the sea route. Let's take land route. What happens to us? Most of the time we get stuck in Libya. And being stuck in Libya means you get sold as a slave. Yes, in the 21st century. So what happened in my situation was... One question for you then is like... All right, before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to take a moment to thank you for tuning in, number one. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, please consider hitting that subscribe button right now. By subscribing, you'll ensure that you never miss an episode of our show, and it helps us grow our channel and continue creating great content that matters to you. So if you find value in what we do, hit the button below, and thank you for being a part of the KRS community. Now, just a quick intro on today's guest, Magat Wade. She's a visionary entrepreneur, an inspirational speaker, and a leading advocate for economic freedom and prosperity in Africa. Her entrepreneurial journey has been featured all over the place. She's been on Forbes, The Guardian, Huffington Post, and definitely check out her TED Talk as well. Now, Mugat is really passionate about creating enterprises that change the perception of business in Africa. She believes in the power of entrepreneurship to drive sustainable economic growth and improve lives it's a fantastic mission. Now, her work extends beyond her business ventures. She is also a strong voice for policy reforms, particularly in the areas of property rights and the rule of law, to create environments where entrepreneurs can thrive in Africa. Now, she was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and a Forbes 20 Youngest Power Women in Africa Mugat is just truly a trailblazer. Now, there is a lot to learn from her. She has a unique perspective that provides valuable insights into navigating the challenges and opportunities of entrepreneurship in emerging markets. I was just absolutely inspired by her story. She has this unwavering determination and a vision for an economically vibrant Africa. If this video, if this is one of those videos where you watch it and you're like, I'm just not doing enough with my life. Like this person is absolutely crushing it on so many levels and taking on the world. It's really inspiring. This is Magat Wade. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Kevin. I appreciate being here. So glad to have you on the show. First thing I want to say is for anyone that has not seen your TED Talk, I know it's five years old now, but it is insanely inspiring. Thank you so much. And it seems like as an entrepreneur and an activist and you know all the things that you are, you do so much. Bring us up to speed, though, since that, that really famous TED Talk. Like, what does your life look like now? Yeah. So, since that TED Talk, so the, the main, the gist of a TED Talk, TED talk I won't um, give people everything, so they have to watch it. But um, the gist of it was, we were in um, Tanzania, in Arusha, and it was in 2017. Uh, yeah, 2017. Uh, before that, we had been in Africa for the first time, TED, for the first time in 2007 in Arusha. Mm. Back then, I was part of the cohort of the TED Fellows. We were the first mm. cohort of TED Fellows, as a matter of fact. And they had picked a hundred Africans from the continent and outside of the continent that they felt would be the trailblazers for the continent, building it, it up. And so, 10 years later, we had a little bit of a reunion, you know, mm. and kind of checking things out a little bit. Um, for me, I, the case I was trying to make is, why is Africa still the poorest region in the world? So, that's the case that that TED Talk is making, yeah. right? And uh, since then, of course, I've made some progress and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it. But um, really, when, when we call me an activist, I like to say that I call myself, I'm a, people say, what type of activist are you? I said, I'm a prosperity activist. And it's on purpose because Africa, unfortunately, still is the poorest region in the world, despite having some of the greatest riches in the world, mm -hmm. starting with its, yo its young population. I don't know if you know, Kevin, but it is the youngest um, continent in the world with the average years is 19 years old. Wow. One nine, one nine. And by 2050, uh, one out of every four people walking this earth will be African. Wow. 
So I think it's important for people to sit with those numbers and just start to think about the magnitude of what this means. Yeah. So for someone like me, of course, I'm thinking, wow, it's great. What a wonderful opportunity. We are the future. We are the future. But what type of future are we talking about? Because if we're going to remain the future, if this future is also going to stay the poorest in the world, I think the world has huge problems coming its way. Yes. Right? Um, and we're already seeing it uh, to some degrees with uh, the immigration uh, process. So the, Amer- the Americans, so people here in the U.S. have been complaining about, you know, um, immigrants coming from further south, you know, Central America, Latin America. But right now, we also have um, immigration coming from uh, Africa. Up till recently, most of the uh, immigration done under more or less, you know, um, illegal um, routes was happening between Africa and um, Europe for the most part. But now there is a route going from West Africa, especially to into the U.S. through Nicaragua, mm. mostly. So um, there is... You know, 10 years ago, so I was giving a talk at uh, MIT. Uh, I think it was maybe more 12 around then. And I said to them, I said, uh, it was a very tech oriented, um, you know, gathering. But I said to them, listen, guys, if nothing is done about the state of Africa, I could see a time, a time in the horizon, not too far out, where we're going to have the entire political, you know, landscape of uh, Europe being completely changed where you have all the extreme right-wing parties winning everywhere based on what? On the promise that they will keep the immigrants, especially from Africa, Mm -hmm. out. And that's exactly what you're seeing. Georgia Meloni, Italy, Victor Orban, Hungary. It's happening everywhere. I think France probably is going to have Marine Le Pen or maybe Eric Zemmour, who knows? Mm -hmm. But it's probably going to be happening. And so we're we're seeing it. We're seeing the shift. Yes. In any case, so... For me, someone like me, I'm sitting there. My argument is not going to be about let more of us in or keep us out. That's really not the argument that I make. The argument that I make is it takes something extraordinary for a group of people to leave everything behind, to leave their families behind, to leave their land behind, to leave their communities behind. In my case, to leave their child behind. My parents, you know, as soon as I was done breastfeeding around age two, my families, my family made a decision that so many African families before them made and so many since them are still making to this day. It means you turn your back. That's how I saw it. But I, but I understand now that's not what it was. But they leave. They, and in my case, my parents didn't take me with them because they knew that uh, the journey they were about to take was not going to be a safe nor maybe yeah. they didn't know if they were, it's work or work, if we're going to have stability on the other end, nothing. They'd much rather see you survive exactly. than take that risk. Exactly. And uh, and, and even if um, it worked for them, they wanted to make sure that they got everything under control and had, would provide stability by the time I come, I come join them. And this is my parents who were able to do it under rather safe, safe conditions. Because do you know what it, what it is for others, Kevin? For others, it is you pack yourself into little fishermen's boats trying to cross to somewhere in Spain because it's the first entry point into the European, into Europe. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes that boat tips somewhere, uh, uh, you know, on the ocean. Yeah. And with, you, or you, you called it at one point, uh, people are turning into fish food. Yeah. Basically, we are still still serving as fish food. And that phenomenon, by the way, has been, has been nothing but accelerating. And at first, it was primarily young men, right? Um, but women and children were staying behind. You know, if it worked, then maybe they could join them through the normal, safe, legal route. Uh, but now, no. Women are leaving. Babies are leaving. And which means that many more of them dead serving as fish food at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. So that's the land route. That's the sea route. When they think that's too dangerous, let's take la- um, land route. What happens to us? Most of the time we get stuck in Libya. And being stuck in Libya means you get sold as a slave. Yes, in the 21st century, someone like me gets caught trying to make it to Europe using land route. We get stuck in Libya. And there we get sold. And do you know my price? 300 to $500. It's insane. Yeah. It took for CNN to talk about it, for the world to believe us. But I, I knew this was happening because so many of us are on some WhatsApp groups where all we do is paying money to buy people's freedom back. Holy shit. All right, let's talk about something near and dear to my heart, investing. So for me, I absolutely have to have someone that is in my corner 
that's a trusted partner that can look at everything holistically. And, and the best type of professional is a CFP, which are certified financial planners. You're probably saying to yourself, I have one of these people at X bank or at this financial institution, and I did as well, but I stopped doing that because these people charge you a percentage of your assets under management. It absolutely sucks. It eats away at your returns. Do not do this. Even if you don't support my sponsor, don't do that. But I do love my sponsor today, Facet. So Facet is cool because they don't charge you a percentage. They just have this affordable membership fee. So Facet is building the future of financial planning, making professional financial advice accessible to the masses, not just the rich. And they also have the full suite. So you also get access to their team of experts across retirement planning, tax strategy, estate planning, and so much more. And it's just, again, an affordable membership fee. This is what I love about this company. So for listeners of this show, Facet is waiving their $250 enrollment fee for new annual members. For a limited time only, you gotta head over to facet.com, F-A-C-E-T.com slash Kevin Rose to learn more. Facet.com slash Kevin Rose, please use that URL. It helps out the show. And uh, check them out. Sponsored by Facet, Facet Wealth Inc. Uh, Facet is a SEC registered investment advisor headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. This is not an offer to sell securities or investment, financial, legal, or tax advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future performance. Terms and conditions apply. So there will be someone that reaches out to you uh, on a WhatsApp group and says, hey, I have this person. They are my slave. And if you send me money, well, how's that done typically? Like a, well, some, a payment? Some, yeah. Um, like, like, it's not PayPal. Like. No, 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 no. So some people, some people, um, so in my case, in, in the, in the, in the ones that I'm in, it's, you're not going to see necessarily the, the people holding our people reaching out to you, but there are some relays, you know, some relays on the ground and right. the people would find out that so and so got caught. And how can you trust that? Because this is what Africans do. We, we, we have always worked as relays. Do you know how much money is living in New York City? You see a lot of, um, a lot of the people that you see selling, uh, goods on the sides, uh, on the side, on the side street of New York City. Yeah. Most of the time they're black people. Ask them where they come from for the most part. They come from Senegal, my country. Mm. What are they? Mouid, like me. And, uh, but these are some very hardworking people. And I'm sure you see them all the time working super hard. Do you know that a lot of the money that they make, they, most of it they send back home to take care of the families that they left home. And a lot of that money does not travel for your banks or anything like that. It's, it's, you're, you're going, I trust you, I know you. So we still, we still have our parallel, you know, like routes like that about everything, mm -hmm. about communi with communications, with money, or um, you need to spend money in the village, for example. There's somebody in there who has that amount of cash, and but uh, somebody in their family members needs something s similar on the US side, mm -hmm. you exchange that way. Wow. Has <laughs> cryptocurrency helped at all? Of course. Oh, of that. course. Really? Crypto has been a life changer, a game changer for us. And you see, that's what excited me so much about crypto because oftentimes we Africans, so many of us, we look at you guys in the West fighting each other, you know, the Bitcoin community, especially. And uh, so I'm more, I'm more a Bitcoin gal. So definitely on my maxi, my maxi, you know, status. Well, you're doing well. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, like we told you to hold, but anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But, um, so what happened is in the West, I think, um, the West has been so spoiled because when you have PayPal, when you have, um, Venmo, you can wire, you things, can Venmo, yeah. you can Zell, you can do all of this stuff. You have bank accounts, you have credit cards. So you live under this great, um, you know, you live into this, under this great, uh, illusion mm -hmm. that you have, um, sound money yes you it's not sound money yes. as you and i know by now and i think many people are starting to discover yes but us we the reason why africa is one of uh, is the region with the fastest adoption of bitcoin and crypto in general is because unlike in the west the signal pain point is very clear for us yeah. when you have non-functioning financial institutions oh for sure you're left with only one thing that works. I yeah. have some people on my team that are from Nigeria. The only way I can pay them is using Bitcoin. Crazy. Without Bitcoin, I could not pay them. All right. Confession time. I'm always trying out new software. And if I'm being honest with you, I jump ship to new stuff all the time. It drives 
my wife crazy, mainly because she's like, what are we using now? Why, why do we, why do we have to move? I will say there is one tool, one application that I've been using for years now, and it just keeps getting better. And that's today's sponsor, which is Notion. I use it to take notes for the books that I'm reading. I use it to track movies, track articles. I actually have the Chrome extension so I can save articles directly to my Notion that I wanna go and revisit later. Uh, it is my personal hub for all the things. Now professionally, it's equally as awesome because you can create these dedicated team spaces that are kind of quarantined and walled off from all of your other personal data. So on the team side, we're talking about guests that we're booking, show notes going there, publish dates, pretty much anything and everything for the podcast. So it's my all encompassing just life hub for all the things my, in my entire life. So Notion combines your docs, your notes, and your projects into one space that's simple and beautifully designed. And now they have a brand new AI, the fully integrated Notion AI helps you work faster, write better, and think bigger doing tasks that normally take you hours in just seconds. And I've tried the AI out and it's cool because you don't have to bounce out to a third party AI app. It's just all built right into Notion, which is great. So try Notion. I know you've heard of Notion, but you probably haven't tried it. If you haven't tried it, go and check it out right now. So try Notion for free when you go to notion.com slash Kevin Rose. That's all lowercase letters, notion.com slash Kevin Rose to try the powerful, easy to use Notion AI today. Make sure to use our link. You'll be supporting the show when you do so. So notion.com slash Kevin Rose. I mean, and I, I hear this uh, time and time again, uh, obviously not just in Africa, but there are certain regions where the inflation and the local currency is a joke. Yes. And if yes. that's the case, yes. like, what are you going to do? Yes. Yes. And so I see a world where five, seven, 10 years out, yeah. there's going to be some serious nations that say, hey, well, there already has been hints yeah. of this. Yes. Maybe this should be the way that we use currency. You that's know? it. That's it. And so for us, um, what it is, is because since we are not obstructed with all these uh, choices, that in at the end are in a way fake, but the West gets to have, but it's still, you know, if it, it still um, makes things easier. We're not obstructed by that. So we see right away the real function of coin or of crypto. Uh, we see it as what it was always designed to be, which is money, sound yeah. money. Yeah. Here, I think people don't understand what money is and also what constitutes good money? It needs to be able to travel back and forth. Mm -hmm. it, um, you don't want to have too many intermediaries in it. And right. most importantly, you don't want to have the ability to tinker it, which yes. is what brings up, you know, inflation, deflation, all of that crap. So anyway, so for us, I think, um, and what I love about our, what's going on with us is here in the West, I see people arguing with each other all the time about the philosophical merits of uh, crypto or not, of Bitcoin or not, whereas we're like, listen, we don't necessarily need to know how the sausage is made, but we know the sausage is right. So that's yeah. all it is. And so we're just the one jumping on it. So have you used cryptocurrency to free a slave? In my case, um, sometimes that's what you have to do. But sometimes you, uh, that's how the money has that to That story is not being told. That that actually is a, a real use case you for know, cryptocurrency. You know, people who would say it, um, this is why I really love the work of people like Alec, Le, Alex Gladstein over at HRF, Human Rights Foundation. You definitely should have him on and have people like, um, you know, Farida. Um, there are so many of these human rights activists around the world. And this, these stories are really nothing. When you compare to some of the activists that are working um, in Iran or are working in Afghanistan or some of these, you know, places where, I mean, literally uh, them, it's not even like you're freeing somebody. It's like you're saving somebody's life. Yeah. Someone is about to be executed. Holy shit. Someone is about to be executed. And if you don't pay up now and the money has, it has to be the amount and it has to arrive on time. If it doesn't, Life doesn't is not worth more than a chicken. And, and that's what in crypto some of these countries. Do. Oh yes, oh yes. So that's why when I hear people trashing crypto all over the place, I'm like, it tells me this is what we call financial privilege. Yes, you have financial privilege. So when you're sitting there and say, oh, we can be paid, no, this is very real. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about freedom or captivity. So the United States using the U.S. dollar is obviously the reserve currency for the world. They must be frightened. You'd have to imagine that somewhere, maybe not yet, maybe they're too old and they can't, they can't see it yet, but yeah. I have a feeling in the next decade, it's going to be like, oh shit, this is going to give us a run for our money in terms of like, you know, a real global universal currency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
But what I like about um, crypto and Bitcoin in general is that we don't have to really wait for any any centralized authority to deem it worthy or not. Yes. And also to stand in the way between us and uh, and uh, the, the the result of our labor. Yeah. You know, uh, because that's money. Really, all it is. It's just a way to for you to standardize. You know, the value of your of your of your labor. But you know, that's yeah. pretty much what it is. It's a Get- store of value. Getting back to to Africa, you know, you you, you I, I see the the horrors that that you're explaining to me around people leaving. Mm-hmm. In your TED talk, you talk about you know reasons why that is the case. These insane tariffs on new goods coming in, which stifle entrepreneurship. Um, what is what has changed since then, and and what do you need to have happen so that rather than leaving. You know, there can be places in Africa that are entrepreneurial hubs that have true, you know, prosperity. That's right. Yeah. So since that TED talk, I think what it did is um, it opened more people to the idea to to even the the diagnosis that I was putting forward. Because you see, as with any problem in the world, uh, Kevin, it all starts with a proper diagnosis. Without it, you might be lucky once in a while and hit it right. But without a proper diagnosis, you're pretty much banging your head against a wall uh, to no end. And so for me, um, so what happened in my situation was, you see, um, I, 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 so my family left Senegal, Senegal and then eventually after a couple of years, after a few years, um, they decided it looks like their immigration journey has worked. And so it was time for me to be reunited with them, which meant being torn away from my grandmother, who had become my caretaker. So for the second time in my life, the very uh, important stage of my life, I get literally ripped away from, you know, my caretakers, the only people I know, um, and all of that. How do you handle that emotionally? You know, it is what it is. And people can say, oh, you were young, it's okay. But, you know, I think that's not understanding the human condition. And so how do I cope with that? This is where, for the most part, um, it does help to not have sometimes the luxury of uh, grieving or having the luxury of being sad about something or having the luxury of uh, saying, this is wrong, this is not fair. Uh, so for me, the, what I did is I think I sublimated it eventually. It was not about me or what I went through. It is what it is and I will never be able to change it. But darn it, I, if, I, if I think I can help another person not have to go through that, mm. you betcha that's where my work is. So no, 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 you know, self-pity for myself. But it's like, how do I make sure that um, this is can be avoided for others? You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it sounds like in a way your therapy to process this is to help others. Yeah. yeah. And so it sounds like you, like the, the what you have, I mean, obviously anyone would have an insane burden yeah. of feeling that pain. Yeah. And if you can even prevent one person from going through what you did, that's, what, that's a release. That's my balm. That's my balm. And, and that will help you release and, and feel better. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's my way of processing it. Yes. And I wish so many more people, you know, could find that space within them because it's a really great way to, you know, let it go and turn, turn the pain into something that's much more, um, uh, what do you call it? Much more productive mm-hmm. and inspirational because you're using this po- this force mm. because it's a force. Yes, uh, but to to do good and right. not let it consume you where it's really negative right. and bad. So so in this case, that's what happened. I uh, I I have been tra- my whole life. So what happened is when I arrived in Germany. That's when that's when I left my country for the first time. My parents were in Germany at that time, and that's when I was called to be back with them. And right there, around age seven, I'm looking around. That's my first time in Germany. And I look around and I'm like, how come they have this? We don't. It was just so shocking for me. How come? And all I was talking about, Kevin, was how come back home when grandma says, my God, it's time for your shower. But in the moment she says that, and the moment the water actively touches my skin, 45 minutes to an hour goes by. Why? Because grandma has to get the charcoal stove going, literally fanning the coal for it to go. And then she puts a pot of hot water, of, um, water on it for it to boil. When it boils, she puts it in a bigger bucket, mixes it with cold water. And then my cousin or somebody stronger drags it to the shower area. And there, at last, I can have my shower. That's what taking a shower back home meant. Hmm. Here, mom says, my God, time for your shower. I'm like, I am not getting bucket in this cold. Where's the bucket of water? Right. Like, Come on, you silly. Just jump in the shower. And there I go. And I turn the buttons and the water is coming. And I'm just like, oh. 
that's what I meant. How come they have this? And we don't. And then the paved roads and then these grocery stores that look so beautiful, you know, with AC in the summer and, uh, you know, heat in the winter and everything just felt so easy. And so little girl, my God, seven was like, huh? You know, it's like, what's going on here? Yeah. And I think, you know, like children can be very crazy about waves. If something doesn't make sense to them, it can really consume them. And that, that was me. I was that child. I'm, I'm still that, that way. I need to be able to make sense of the world. Otherwise, yeah. it doesn't work. And so that question literally defined the, the, the rest of my life. That's the reason I'm sitting here talking to you. That's what yeah. led me to everything. So uh, the question became how, co- became, how come some countries like mine are poor while others are rich? Yeah. And along the journey, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. Chief among them being... Oh, darling, it's not your fault. It's just because, you know, blacks and browns are just not as smart as white people. You know, the IQ theory. And I know that that IQ theory has been peddled around by some people in the Bay Area, especially, and uh, around the U.S., who actually seem to have the ear of some very interesting, you know, tech entrepreneurs, all of that. People that I'm like, but that's a, that's a conversation for another day. It's- it's okay. Like, sometimes you, the best way to argue I something... I can't believe that's still a thing, that people are having that discussion. Sometimes the best way to argue something is to show. Is yeah. to show. And that's why we also are going to show. You know, we are going to get our, con- our continent to be one of the best in the world. And then we will settle that one. It's okay. Um, so anyway, so some people say that. And others would say, oh, you guys are always fighting each other. All of these wars that you have, you guys are lazy. So what I have found, Kevin, is very interesting. It's just because if you could put um, two groups of people in uh, like Africans here, non-Africans here, and you ask these uh, people, why is Africa the poorest region in the world? So from the Africans and their usual allies, um, traditionally people maybe from the left, um, will say they will come up with all the victimhood, you know, uh, reasons as to why that's the case. Racism, um, colonialism, slavery, there's people are stealing on natural resources. You'll hear it all on that side. All right. It's that time. This episode is brought to you by Manscaped. True story. A few years ago, I got their razor. Uh, it's called the lawnmower. It's fantastic. And it's largely because, how do we say this? If you're trimming these sensitive areas that you, we have, we all have, uh, you can get cut and it's not fun. It hurts and it's not a good look. So they have something called the skin safe blade that doesn't cut you when you're trimming some sensitive areas. I've been using the lawnmower ever since, but secondly, I truly love their beard hedger. It has 20 different length adjustments with this little zoom wheel right in the center. So you don't have to put on like all these different heads or anything. It just kind of moves the head. It is really awesome because It's a modern shaver. I've tried pretty much all of the other brands out there. They all make you have like these weird adapters that you take with them. This is USB-C. I just plug it in and it charges. It's awesome. Other things I love about it, waterproof. So you can just wash it. It's super easy. You can take it in the shower if you want. Anyway, you guys, you gotta gotta try this. It really is my favorite razor. Head on over to manscaped.com and use the code Kevin Rose for 20% off plus free shipping. Try the beard trimmer. If you don't like it, you get a 30 day money back guarantee. Uh, You will thank me and definitely your partner will thank you for getting the lawnmower because you got to keep that shit tight. You got to keep it a little bit short. It doesn't, you don't want too much. The manscaped.com and use the code Kevin Rose for 20% off plus free shipping. My, my uneducated, just to give you a classic old white guy take, uh, Please don't judge me. I'm, judge I'm, I'm learning here. This is a learning session. You. Is um is is corruption. I hear a lot of government corruption. Yeah. You know, the news stories that we are peddled are government corruption and like, you know, even like, you know, uh, danger, a yeah. uh, very unsafe place, uh, pirates overtaking ships. I mean, you hear it all. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So, on one end, you hear all of that. Uh, the non-Africans, um, the non-Africans, especially those who are, have no sympathy for Africans, will say the lazy thing, the IQ thing that I told you about. You guys are fighting all the time. All of that stuff. And yes, from both sides, we'll hear bad leaders who are completely corrupt. You know, the corruption we're talking yeah. about. And yeah, thanks to um, Western media um, that seem to always focus more on the negative than the positive. I'm not saying that those things are not happening, but if you make it the whole story, then you're de facto lying because you're making it sound like this is the truth. When the truth is, 
uh, X percentage of this, X percentage of that, and there are some great things happening. That's the truth. Right. Not just like always boom, 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 bad stuff. So It's um, kind of like with America in that way. There's the a thing. lot of corrupt shit in America. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, when they say, oh, Africa is so corrupt, or they say, oh, is Senegal corrupt? I'm like, yeah, almost as bad as Chicago. <laughs> yeah. I like, don't. Yeah. So anyway, but um, look, all of that is happening. All of that is happening. And the pirates we're talking about, you know, along the coast of Somalia, yeah. it's, it's definitely there. And in some parts of uh, Kenya, definitely there. Is it less than some of the parts of the world? Some of the parts of the world also have their pirates as well. Sure. So, but the bottom line is, I, I look at all of that and I hear all of it. And um, because of what I've gone through now, I know better. Because what I went through, so left Senegal, left uh, Germany after a couple of years, then moved with my family to France. France is where I got mostly educated. And after business school in France, I decided that France would be too small for my ambitions. Made it to the U.S. and literally built an amazing life for myself. I mean, very good life for myself. And uh, if anybody doubts about the fact that the American dream is real, I am a walking story of it. I'm sure in your own way you might be. So, um did so well for myself. Um, at barely, I was not even 25. I had bought a house in one of the most expensive zip codes in the US, you know, Los Altos Hills. I'm sure you heard of where that is. All of that. And it was just um, great. But one day I broke down. One day I literally broke down um, as I was driving down. It was one of those days when I was celebrating all of this great success and also feeling all of this wonderful gratitude for all the people who along the journey showed up for me. Um, thanking God for having taken me from one place to another, giving me all of these opportunities, putting all of these people in my, in my path. Because from, in my mind, well, you know, God is not something you're going to see here and here. It's in you, it's in the next person. And he exercises his grace for you and for the next person. And that's how, you know, that, that exchange between us. That's mm. what God is. That's how, you know, experience God, right? So anyway, um, having a lot of gratitude, uh, for all of that and everybody. And then just right away, then, what would happen always to me when I, I am in that place of happiness, true happiness and gratitude, um, my mood of that day turned really dark. And, um, and uh, usually it would, it would always happen. So I, I knew. And, but I also had always relied on one thing when that happened to me. I relied on just pushing it under the rug. What am I calling it? It's basically when you're in this extreme moment of joy, thinking about everything that life has afforded you, in this case, this am amazing abundance of what I was living in my life, having to, having to compare it to the life of scarcity that I had left back home. Mm -hmm. Having to um, you know, be reminded of those dead people that I told you about. Mm -hmm. Children separated from their families that I talked about. Bodies dropping from airplanes. Because sometimes that's how people try to, you know, um, migrate. People being sold somewhere. At some point, you can imagine it's just overwhelming. Yeah. And so my whole life has been overwhelming. Yeah. Because my whole life, those stories have been my lot. Yeah. And um, usually, I just tell myself, come on, this is bigger than you. It was there before you. Sadly, we'll be there after you. There's nothing you can do. Live your life. Try to have a good life for yourself. And it will be as good as anything else. And that day, though, you know, they say the mind has an amazing ability to pretty much um, justify anything. That's how I think some people, you know, Nazis or whatever, committing the most atrocious crimes and mm -hmm. finding a way to justify it. Sure. But the body doesn't have that ability. Mm -hmm. And that day, my body separated from my mind. Body said to the mind, you keep telling yourself whatever you want. We can't go on like this. Yeah. And eventually, physically, I jerked. I was driving. I was about to end up dead at the bottom, you know, like above from the cliff on highway, on highway one, you know, at the level of Big Sur. Yeah. Stopped the car and made my deal with God. I said, you know, from here on, this is, this is it. I just want to make sure that uh, everything that I do from here on is going to be serving, um, you know, my continent. And uh, you show me the way because I don't know what to do, but, uh, but I'm recording for duty. Show me. Tell me. Hmm. And eventually I became an entrepreneur. I shortly after that, a few months later, I went home to Senegal and then I realized that the hibiscus drink I grew up with had disappeared uh, because my people always, always think that uh, we are, whatever comes from us is not good enough. So we have this complex of inferiority, whether we admit it or not. Hmm. That's another thing I discovered. Anyway, 
Um, and most importantly, the women who used to grow the hibiscus, which was the main ingredient for this beverage, mm -hmm. were losing their livelihood because now everybody prefers to drink Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, Pepsi, Fanta, because that's a cool thing to do. And uh, so you these mean locally, like that yeah. was like oh yeah, the big corporations oh, come yeah. in and run oh, the marketing campaign. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So the and of course it's gonna fuck up everyone's health. You that's know? it. That's it. Yeah. So and it was making me so sad that while uh, Coca Cola sales were going down five percent at least in the U.S. and in the Western world because they're waking up to the madness of high corn fructose syrup you know, and other crap like that. I mean, the amount of sugar that's inside and caffeine that's inside a Coke of can, uh, a, a Coke, and, and then to see some parents, the kid is sipping, you know, this whole thing. I was just like mad. So while their sales were going down 5% or so in the West, it was going up double digits in the Western world, in the, in the poor nations. And I'm sitting there being like, where are we ever going to get a break? Uh, everything about us so, so, seems to be so not going the right way. And the women who used to grow the hibiscus, losing their livelihood, leaving the countryside, going to the cities, packing themselves there, becoming maids, treated like crap. It was overwhelming. Eventually, at some point, you know, put two and two together. My God, you were always raised to criticize by creating. Hmm. You got a problem with this. What's your solution? Yes. It doesn't have to be the right one, but get on that journey of solving this problem right? Criticized by creating. So that's exactly what I did. Mm. So I started my first company and I remember starting my little kitchen. And at some point you look around my boardroom and you have Roger Enrico, the ex-chairman of PepsiCo. You had Greg Sullivan Paul, who had founded Odwala, sold to Coca-Cola. Oh, that's amazing. You had uh, Bello, you know, created a uh, Sobe, sold to... Uh, um, so the whole school of the beverage industry was mm. right there. So that was my first inroad with uh, entrepreneurship. But while I was building that business... Kevin, my aunt's Vicky, my aunt's Vicky, because we had a sister company in Senegal, a sister company in the US. And at every level of starting and running business, the, those businesses was too technically but the same, right? Mm -hmm. That's when I saw it. I saw it. I saw it. I saw that in my country back then, it took me almost two years to legally register the business. We're talking now 2003, uh, 2004. In the U.S., it was taking barely 20 minutes to file up yeah, for your LLC. I was going to say, I can, I can get you an LLC by the end of this conversation. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, over here, you had to have a few thousand dollars to open a bank account. Hmm. Over here, almost nothing. 20 bucks, five dollars and even. Over here, if I want to hire you, Kevin, I, we have to sign a paper, uh, the contract in free, um, you know, um, example, examples. Then I have to literally drive it myself or take it physically myself to the, uh, to the government office, which is called l'inspection du travail, labor inspection office, where a government official will tell me, get to tell me if you and I get to work together. What, what's the criteria for that? Well, they're going to look at uh, even your physical uh, adaptability. They're going to say to you, by the way. What does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, you have to go to a doctor. Seeking, Are you serious? I'm seeking everywhere. You have to go to a doctor. The doctor has to give like you. Like a health check? Yes, yes. That you can do, that you, you're physically apt for this job. Even if it's a desk job. I just don't even understand how that could ever possibly. I mean, talking about stifling entrepreneurship. That's my, that's my point. That's my point. And then uh, they Who will has say. the money to even do all that? Or the time or the travel accommodations or you name it. There you go. And then this, the government official who has never worked in, a, in the private sector for the most part doesn't even know where we are, doesn't understand anything about my business, gets to tell me if you and I get, can work together. And most of the time, we'll have to do that trip two or three times because at some point also, he's going to say, well, Gavin has a degree, uh, he has a PhD in, um, in German. Mind you, but I don't care about that worthless degree of yours. Oh, well, because he has a PhD, the minimum salary you have to pay him is X, which might be three, four or five times more than what the budget of this job I have for you. And that's why you have so many um, graduates who sit home. That's why half of our graduate, uh, university graduates can't find a job. And the more graduated you are, the less, the less, the more you're going to be, uh, not be able to find a job. I mean, how can you, that sounds like step one is to abolish all that, that paperwork. All of that paperwork. Yeah. So, and that, here I just talked to you about that. The minute I hire you, I need to start building a file on you because that's, only, that's going to be the only way I can get to fire you. Because once that happens, let's say you're stealing from me, you're not coming on time repeatedly, um, you're not being careful about your job, I need to fire you in the US, it would be, look, it's not working out, goodbye, goodbye, two weeks notice, I don't even wait for the two weeks, I pay you that two weeks and you're gone. 
here we have to go to the same office again and uh, kind of put it through. That person has to agree. They will fight you. And usually you, the employer, you have to hire a, a lawyer where then they only have to have a union representative represent them. Cost them nothing. So the cost of suing you, going after you, costs them nothing. And it's a whole business because the union leaders, that's all they wait for when you go to the court, like these piles, each one of them. And anyway, so it's like that. Uh, um, the 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 permit the permit situation everything everywhere laws and regulations are waiting for you around the corner so at first i thought kevin i guess so i guess it makes sense we're poor because you know um it's it's because we're poor that everything is so cumbersome and over here it's because we're rich that everything seems to work so well just come to understand wait a second you're poor because you don't have enough money at least not enough money to take care of your basic needs you don't have enough, you don't have money because you, you don't have a source of, uh, you don't have, um, money because you have no source of income. What is a source of income for most of us? It's a job. Where do jobs come from? The, these businesses. What do businesses need? An enabling business environment. Oh, but wait, you just told me that in these countries, you had the worst business environments in the world. Right. So then I'm like, and then, and also forget, I mean, you got the local entrepreneurs, but then you have international organizations that say, Hey, if I'm going to come open a, a plant here, I'm going to open and, and produce some livelihood. Yeah. Why would I want to go through all those hurdles? That question you ask yourself is what most companies who could set up shop in our countries, whether local or not do. That's what so many wonderful, um, diaspora people, that's the question they ask themselves. There is a reason why you have so many successful Nigerian entrepreneurs, so many successful African entrepreneurs in this country. The same people argue you sent them back home. They couldn't do it. Mm. It's not because it's them. It's the same person, but right. still achieving the same thing. I argue that if Elon Musk was today, still had to operate from South Africa, yeah. we would not have Tesla. We would not have, um, you know, um, SpaceX. SpaceX. Or, yeah. None of that would be happening. Yeah. Same guy. If Elon stayed in Africa, or if I sent Zuckerberg anywhere in Africa, yeah. we would not be having any of these companies. Is South Africa easier to operate in? It is easier, but uh, you see, the thing is like when we're comparing, it is easier when it is easier within the African continent. But even with, but if you take out South Africa and start comparing it to the rest of the world, it's still in the, in, in the crap, in the crap uh, um, cohort. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so, so yeah. So that's what you ask. So this, all of this, when you put it all together, these laws, regulations that rule the business environment, um, the rule of law, the, the fact that you have access uh, to clear and transferable property rights, all of that stuff, all of those things when you put them together, the permits, everything, the economies call it economic freedom. It's how free are you to enterprise or mm -hmm. not. And when you look there, there are many economic uh, indexes that measure that. Who ranks number one? Uh, who ranks number one? You have places like Singapore. You have, uh, but so the top 10 is going to be Singapore. So Singapore is even easier in the United States. Like you oh, can, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Yes. I wish I, I felt like it. I haven't been, so I can't really judge it, but I hear that there's not a, really a deep culture there. It feels like very sterile to me. Well, that's a thing. So what we're talking about is just think about the business environment. So this is why uh, for the rest of the conversation, what I'm talking about is very important. So if we just stick to business, if we just yeah. stick to trying to create an enabling business environment, yes. once you do that, you create a little sandbox, then then the magic starts to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, this doesn't work because the central planner said, we're going to do this. Everything we, all the good we've had has come through what I call emergent order. Emergent order just allows the most, um, the most competitive behaviors, laws, regulation, whatever, to emerge out of just chaos, what seems like chaos. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a wisdom of the market. You know, when we talk about the market, it's not like it's a weird thing. It's just a wisdom of the market. And so anyway, um, economic freedom is something that's very real. So it's measured by many indexes, whether it's a doing business index of a World Bank or the Heritage uh, Economic Freedom Index of, uh, you know, all of those. What do they show? They show what I live through as an entrepreneur. I'm building my third company right now. And trust me, a few things have gotten better, but on a grand scheme of things, not enough to, to really uh, make, make that change that we so desperately need. Mm -hmm. And so what it, what they show, what they all show is it is harder to do business in almost anywhere in sub-Saharan Africa than it is in say anywhere in Scandinavia. And I take mm -hmm. Scandinavia on purpose because even anti-business people like Bernie Sanders love to take Scandinavia. 
right? Thinking that, oh, it's a socialist nation. That's not understanding Scandinavian, how it works. It's not a socialist nation. Maybe the way they provide their welfare and that, that, that side of their organization might look socialist to, to people. Um, but the way they make money is very much the good old capitalist way. Mm-hmm. And so in any case, when you realize that, then it all starts to make sense. Africa is the poorest region in the world because it's a region in the world that, uh, where we have the worst business environments in the world. And if you have a bad business environment, your entrepreneurs simply can't do the magic that entrepreneurs they leave. do. Exactly. So one question for you then is like, where do you find that you're going to have the most impact? Is it going to be starting something or I, in some sense, I, I kind of like feel like running for office or something might, no. be, might be a better path. For no, you. not even, not even. So when you see, when you start to understand the level of the issue that we have, then your path, your path is very clear. The pathway is very clear. So there are a few things that I have to do, which is what I am doing and which I, which is what I'm exhorting as many people who finally get it to do the same thing. So it was very important uh, for us to set the record straight as to the diagnosis as to why yes. this, con- this continent still is the poorest in the world. And then my fellow Africans always get mad at me because like, my God, it's in the country, it's 44 nations, it's 44 nations, 54 nations. I'm like, yeah, I know it's 54, 55 or 56, depending on how you count. Because, you know, some countries are still in dispute, like this one in the Northern Moroccan part. But anyway, um, I speak of Africa almost as a village because when it comes to the problem I'm talking about, we look like a village because except for four African nations, almost, I mean, everyone else is in the bottom half of a doing business index ranking, mm. especially in sub-Saharan, the sub-Saharan African nations. So I'm sorry, this is looking like a village. We share the same problem. So do you, how do you, what's your plan of attack? So let me tell you. Is, 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 it, is it village by village? No, is let it, me tell you. The okay. plan of attack is really cool. So planning of attack is, as with everything, awareness first. That's why mm-hmm. I wrote this book. I was kicking myself, driving down here. I'm like, my God, where is your copy for Kevin? I ship you one. Amazing. Tell people so, right now the name of the book. So it's called it The Heart of a Cheetah. So that book talks about everything you and I talked about. And it also goes into the history part as to how we got here. We, uh, so, basically, so quickly here, I'll tell you what happened is, um, um, most African nations uh, that were getting their independences, so-called independences, that was happening towards the end of the 50, uh, late 50s, early 60s. Right around that time is when, um, you know, we had socialism being like, it was the ideology en vogue. Any respectable intellectual was socialist. Only crazies and nuts w- were not socialist. So that was the ideology en vogue at that time. People need to remember that. At the same time, it was uh, traditionally Marxist socialists that have been fighting for racial equality back in those times. Remember, African nations haven't had their independences yet, right? So the Marxist socialists were the ones who were fighting for racial equality. At the same time, we had, ju- we, we, there was slavery, um, you know, like if we go past, if, if you were just to start with slavery, but I will always say people, we were, we had people in Africa before slavery. So I always look back at that time. But in this case, these people were about to, uh, f- to finally colonization was about to end. Before that, there was slavery. And then I think before that, most people forgot that we were free people. But anyway, here you are. Put yourself into the mental mindset. Here they are. And with these two, ideologies butting head with each other on one end here freedom represented by the western nations and their um economic system was capitalism facing off with very uh with uh, the other block that's uh, promoting various forms of statism the eastern block for the most part and they're looking for influence because that's how you win i mean that's what ideology looks for always to mm-hmm. influence the more you influence people and the more you're going to win right? right and then you can proceed to to implement so they were fight, they were, these two ideologies were at the height of a battle. Meanwhile, you know, we had, um, uh, the uh, Soviet Union ma- telling the world that, uh, communism was working, all of that, all the lies that right. we found out were lies afterwards. But anyway, so our people said, so between the fact that, uh, Marxist socialists have been the one facing for racial equality, the fact that, um, you, you had a, um, they're looking, you know, they're looking at the psychological mindset and thinking to themselves, you, you, the West, 
have colonized us. We're the ones who are, we're still colonized by you. If you think we're going to, you know, buy your ideology, no way. And so they sided with the other side. And also the fact that at that time, socialism was pretty much the ideology en vogue. Anybody serious was a socialist. So when you put those three factors together, what happened? The, the African liberators, because we had many people fighting for African, for, Af for their African countries to be, to be liberated. In Nyerere, in Tanzania, you had, um, you know, Kenyatta for Kenya, in my country, you know, um, everywhere you had people fighting. Uh, and this was like, because they saw Gandhi was, you know, about to, I mean, I mean, this was, I mean, the, it was, the air must have been so electric to see that the largest colonized nation is about to get its independence from the largest colonizer in the world, Great Britain in this case. So they, um, so that was the, what was going on. So eventually they sided with a Marxist socialist. Mm -hmm. And that's how most of uh, African nations as becoming these free nations were ran by, for the most part, Marxist socialists. Even the ones that were not supposedly socialists, like Nigeria, for example, still um, were running five-year plans, mm. you know, which is hardly super capitalist because there is, capital, there is, there is levels, right? Mm -hmm. So they would say, oh, no, we're not socialists, but we are definitely not like, a, you don't have a level of capitalism that's going to be needed to thrive. And so this has been, Kevin, the, the, the um, what can I say, the tragedy, the tragedy yeah. at that important fork of our life, we took the wrong fork at yeah. that time of our life. And then, of course, nothing to show for it. 60 some plus years later, here we are talking about Africa being poor. So is, is this a series of iterative uh, changes that gets you to where you want to be? Or is it a revolution? That's what we're going to share. So it was important for me to share that. So the book has all of that. And then the book will go into goes into solutions. So important to have diagnosis. Everybody needs to have a diagnosis, right? Because as long as we have what I t we and I talked about earlier, you line up 100 Africans here, another 100 non-Africans over there, you ask them, why is Africa poor? No one tells you Africa is the poorest region in the world because it's the one that has the least economic freedom for its entrepreneurs. If no, if no one can make the, connect those dots, how do you think we're going to solve that problem? Yeah. Right. So that diagnosis needs to be to be to be to to be set straight, and that's what the book is doing, and that's why being you know here talking to you, and I'm so appreciative that you're giving me this opportunity because the more the story goes out, and the more we get closer to the solution. Because me, I'm advancing a solution. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But what I love about more people knowing about something is because the power of the crowd. Mm -hmm. Remember when we talked about it before? Yeah. The wisdom of the crowd. You, me, we, we, I can't even imagine what might come out of your mind once you have your finger on the right diagnosis. Because then your mind, your gears are going to get on. Right. You know? And then you're going to be starting to work from that, from that framework. But if your framework is Africa is poor because of racism, guess what? You're going to come up with DEI crap and who knows what else, right? right? Or if you think Africa is, uh, is, is, is poor because the IQ is so low, you're never going to think about even the type of stuff I talk about because you're going to say, my God, why are we going to bother even cleaning up the business environment because these people are too stupid for their own, for their own uh, good to even make, to make anything of what we're going to do. So that's not what we should work on. Maybe we should work on aid. Maybe we should work on helping them against themselves mm -hmm. because they're so stupid. The only way to help them is to actually substitute to their brains. You see why what you identify to be the problem matters so much because yes. then you'll work, go work towards that. 100%. And right now, no one mostly has been working towards greater economic freedom. Yeah. So... So the solution in this case has been, so once I discovered all of that, I was just like, first of all, I was liberated. True liberation descended upon me. True liberation. Because I have to tell you, I think at some point in my life, me too. And I've, 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 I've compared notes with some of my other African friends. And even today, when I tell this story to some of my other African friends, at some point, the conversation is, wow, I'm so glad. I, I, I never thought about it this way, but... Uh, and then we go into the little confession part. Um, oh my God, I have to tell you, at some point I thought that maybe this is, this is all there will be for us. Maybe we are doomed. Maybe we are just, maybe, maybe there's something wrong with us. These are the things we talk about among ourselves. We get it out. But um, yeah, at some, because at some point, how do you explain all of this? Uh, so anyway, then when I discovered it's about economic freedom, the business environment has to be brought to world class. Then um, that took me to the journey of becoming the uh, director for the African Center for Prosperity of the Atlas Network, which is the largest free market uh, think tanks uh, network in the world. And there, you know, uh, just really working with the ones in Africa. 
uh, primarily working on reforms, um, you know, to get the business environments better and various forms of uh, freedom to be, you know, enacted on the continent. Is, con- that, is that really, I mean, it's funny, I've seen so many, and not in Africa, obviously, but I've seen these working groups that have the best of intentions for various causes. And they just hit wall after wall after wall. That's, that's a thing. So our Atlas partners, I must say, are doing amazing work, especially uh, you have people in South Sudan who are working on putting women's property rights into the constitution and doing very well. Others in- what do you mean women's property rights? Women can <laughs> own property? Are you serious? Only men can own, pro- own property. Yeah. So basically, let, let me turn it around. So um, in Burundi, women... Uh, have don't have access to proper right until our people worked on that and they got it to put it into the constitution. Before that, it was not the case. Then you have places like South Sudan where it is in the constitution, but the all the stakeholders are not uh, necessarily on board. Like the women who are the first beneficiaries in, on it don't necessarily know that they have this right. And the rest of the stakeholders, meaning uh, the judicial system, as well as the husbands, as well as the, the you know, the, the family in laws, Everybody else is just like acting like it's not, it doesn't, it, those rights don't exist. So the women de facto don't benefit from those rights that are in the constitution. So in the case of the South Sudanese uh, groups, what their job was all about, about doing was making those rights known and also explaining to the stakeholders how actually it works for everybody to really um, respect those rights and making really good inroads. So that's great. Burundi, those rights don't exist. And so they had to put it to the constitution. And they did some great work and there, you know, you, you imagine the campaigns you have to do and then kind of help prepare these laws and all of that stuff. So people are doing amazing work everywhere. But my issue is it's going to slow. Mm-hmm. We're, we're not going to, sl- we're not going to stop those efforts. They need to continue and they need to try and go faster. So I am a firm, firm believer and supporter of this free market think tanks. If people want to support Atlas Network is a great place to do that. Um, meanwhile, I am sitting there and seeing that every year, oh, Tens of millions of new people, young people are coming of age of working with no prospect for work. We have a ticking bomb on our hands. We have to find something radical. So when you were coming about the revolution, Mm -hmm. radical. And that's not going to come from me running as a president or anything like that, because I think people don't understand that presidents have very little power, whether it's in this country or mm. many places, yeah. right? Unless you're a flat out, you know, dictator and maybe you can move things faster. I don't know. But, um, or I do know. Um, so in any case, so in this case, so what did the, what was, what is the solution? Uh, so while this piecemeal legislation is happening over there with our think tanks and they need to continue that work. I'm saying we need to accelerate. So what are we doing? Startup cities. These are special, next generation, special economic zones with their own law and their own oh, governance. Their own law. Uh huh. How did you pull that off? Uh huh. Has this with, been done yet? Uh-huh. Or no. Uh, I will tell you. With their own law, on governance, and also custom regulatory framework. So. The best way to think about it is think about the piece, uh, a piece of land of the size of a city, of the size of a city. And think of it as your computer. So the land is like a computer, but then the laws that rule it become your operating software. And when it comes to the poor nations, they're poor because they're running the, some very, very old softwares, Techno- crappy technologies, yesteryear technologies. Yes. And so what do we have to do? But because we exist in a um, global world, we have to be, you know, cutting edge. Yes. We have to be cutting edge because when a company can choose to be anywhere in the world and you, the, la- the, the latest, um, you know, down- upgrade you're proposing is an 80s software. I'm sorry. When you have Singapore, which is at the next level, it's just not going to happen. They're going to yeah. suck up everybody and you're going to stay in the dust. That's what's where we are right now. So, um, in this situation, what you do is you say, uh, and by the way, it's nothing really new. I, what is kind of new is more like uh, what we call the custom regulatory framework part. Because when you think about it, um, Singapore did nothing else than that, but they did it at, uh, at a country level because it's small enough and they can do it at the country level. Hong Kong, same thing. Pretty much all the Asian, Asian tigers did this. I mean, Dubai. Dubai, who decided that on 110 acres of land, oh, maybe the law that we have is not good for uh, business. So we're going to look around and think mm. about the best, you know, uh, practices in the world. And it always, always, countries that run on British common law, by the way, always are way there. That's because British, British common law is just 
it's like I, like I hadn't even thought about that by the way because no, I've they, been to Dubai a few mm-hmm, times mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it's like you've got really strict ra- laws and regulations yeah for everything peppered else around everywhere yeah, yeah and then you go into your hotel and they're like hey by the way yeah you're in the hotel you yeah can, you can have some drinks in here exactly you know it's illegal but Ex- you, yeah you, you can have some drinks that's a thing that's a thing yeah. that's a thing so and when it comes to business so really for dubai what dubai the great insight of the rules of dubai was but A, um, in this case, they're running Sharia law, and it's not the best, you know, for, for at least what they were trying to attract business, the, especially in the financial side. So for the Dubai Interna- International Financial Center, on 110 acres of land, the rulers of Dubai said, here, we're going to operate different laws hmm. from the rest of Dubai and see what happens. So you're taking a part of that playbook. Yes. And how far are you and taking it And taking it much, much further down. And so, so basically, you do that, and then um, in their case, they hired retired British common law judges to come and educate the law and all of that good stuff. And then, twenty some years later, Dubai just entered the top ten international yeah. financial centers of the world. Well, let me ask you a question. So, I'm I'm really fascinated by this because, like, oftentimes, and obviously, you know way more than I do about this. But people in power don't want to lose power. <laughs> it turns out. Let's talk about and that. So and so. You've got a framework that it may not be working, but I'm imagining that there are people at the top yeah. that are doing okay. Yes. Yes. And so if you if you don't screw with those people, yes. how do you convince them to take a chunk of land and give it up? Give up their rule their ruling over that that piece of property. Right, right. So the way it works is that the question you asked is precisely the reason why we do cities and not at a whole country level. Right. Multiple. So, um, not all country, not the whole country at once, because um, Too big. change, change yeah. is. First of all, even if it's going to be better for people, uh, you know how it is. Every time you try to change something, people anything doesn't the, matter what it is. People bitch up and down the street until the cows come home, even if it's the best thing for them. So, what you don't want is to impose the change on people. That's why. You go to this rather unoccupied, that's another key word, a rather unoccupied piece of land. So you're not displacing anyone. And if you're getting there and there are people there, you pay them above market rate for, you know, um, yes. seeding their, their, their land. So it's a, it's a, it's a normal transaction. Oh, you've probably right? heard about what's going on in the Bay Area right now. I know. They're, I they're know. creating their own little mini city yes. outside of San Francisco yes. where they pay yes. all the farmers, bought the land. Bought for land. But then they're going to have bigger problems. Well, that's a very, that's a very interesting one. Yeah. Um, and so there, a rather unoccupied piece of land. If not, you buy the land above market rate. So you stay super clean, no problem, no right. shadiness. And the people who want to stay there, then you give them an upside into the project, right? They're deciding to stay with you. They're going to put the land and of course, like an investment. And there you, uh, so that's why you go there and, um, you don't do it at the country level. So then people who decide to come in, it's a voluntary, move on their part to come in and be part of that. And then the people who just want to stay on the sideline and check it out for a while, they can do that as well. So it's like you get to try before you buy. Mm -hmm. And so that's number one. Number two, it's because um, you can imagine, especially, and I'll I'll give you some examples of some of the countries without telling you the names, because you can understand these are very, very um, uh, sensitive. Uh, questions, but uh, some of these countries where when you st- when you come in, they're running on civil law. Civil law is terrible for business, as we all know. But um, so in this case, you absolutely must turn the place into a common law uh, jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. So there, you can only imagine that it's one thing to change the laws, but you have to, everything has to trickle down. The judges have to be trained the right way. The lawyers have to know what the hell is going yes. on. I mean, the whole system has to be following. So if you want to try to do it at the country level, good luck with that. Right. 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 And so, um, so that's another reason. But, 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 but the biggest reason is what you talked about too. When this, this, this mess, and even though this country, like in mine, 25 poorest countries, among the 25 poorest countries in the world, Somebody is making a lot of money. Yes. Somebody's are making a lot of money. Hell yeah. That's right. Uh, maybe even the top person as well, right? Uh, so you trying to go there and change the rules, you might as well just take uh, a gun and shoot it to your own head. It will be faster and less painful maybe. Yes. Right? So you don't do that. You don't do that. Leave everything alone. Leave everything alone. But then work with, the, with the, the next level of what I would call the elite, of, you work with the next level of people who have access. So the ones who have so much access that they're like, you know, benefiting from the status quo, 
Valerie's are not going to be the ones you work with, mm. but it's the next, uh, it's the next uh, in line. Mm-hmm. So maybe the cousins, those people who are smelling it, yes. but not able to taste it. Yes. Those guys. Because they're looking for opportunity. Yes. They have access yes. also. Yes. Because you cannot do this without the leader of a country, of right. course. I mean, I'm not, we're not here to be like, a, what do you call them? Like a neo-colonialist. That's not the plan. So then with this, this group of people who have access to the president, and or to the key ministers, in this case, ministers of finance, for sure, economy, those are the type of people I'm usually looking for. Then with them, we say, we're going to go build something over there where you're not threatening it, anything here. Right. And at some point, what happens as this starts to work, even the guys here start to realize, oh, I can make money over there. But they know by the right. time they come, they know what the rules are. And eventually they even find that, oh my God, you mean I no longer have to go and kiss ass to this president that I actually think is really... I have no choice right now because if I say something bad, right. if I do anything, I'm going to be, you know? Right. So he all of a sudden learning that, wow, I can do business in a way where I don't have to spend half of my work and, uh, work and hours trying to kiss ass or to please, where here I just do it. I can, I can all of it toward my business, grow my business bigger. And it's really, a Trojan horse. Yeah. Finally be a, a clean man. Yeah. You know? see, well, you're starting a small, you, you prove out a model. Yes. And then you do it where no one's even kind of like watching. Exactly. Just kind of off to the side. Exactly. And then you get enough momentum and ground And then that's, and then and that's, that's it. That's replicated. And then that's it. So what we're doing is, so and when I was talking about our own law and governance, the best way to think about it is we are not interested in touching anything that, um, that uh, affects the sovereignty status of a nation. That is really not the plan. Because remember, we said, all we're after is building an enabling business environment so that the magic of wealth and prosperity can start to happen, right? And so here, all we're changing, all we're tackling is the business laws. And so we only deal with business laws. We don't touch criminal law. We don't touch family law. We don't touch immigration law. We don't touch any of that stuff, mm. right? And so, and then there, though, we start with a blank canvas and then we start to design our things. And so the best way to think about what, uh, has been done so far. And so the, the best model for this. So there are, ma- there are, it's a very nascent industry. And I think you can appreciate it because I heard you earlier say that you love, you know, like things that are at the cutting edge, just getting started. Yes. This is so nascent. Yeah. It's not even a joke. So, um, we, in my mind, the best such city. So for people who are interested in this topic, they will find more information under what's called charter cities, cities with their own charter. I call mine startup cities because that's really what the goal is. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's an area to basically start, you know, for businesses to be started and be ran. Hey, well, where, how far along are you in that process? Okay. Is there land identified? So, is there infrastructure yeah, going yeah, in? Like, yeah, what's up? yeah. It's too bad you were not there recently, but, uh, so the group that has done an amazing, amazing, amazing work on this is called Prospera. So Prospera. And uh, right now, so Prospera, in my mind, is the most advanced startup cities um, in the world. You know, like the ones that are doing what I'm talking about right mm-hmm. now. And it's based on the island of Roitan. So there, yes, there's a physical area mm-hmm. on the island of Roitan, where basically um, the laws that are designed, you get to have um, um, choice of law, but beyond choice of law, choice of regulations, regulatory choice as well. So let's just walk people through what that means. And for me, that's the magic of uh, really what Prosper has been able to accomplish. So you see, right, right now, if a multinational settles somewhere, you get, they get the, what I call the choice of law. Choice of law means, do you, do you decide to incorporate under Delaware law, New York law, Briti- you know, British law, or multinationals have that capability. Mm-hmm. And we're saying, why shouldn't everybody has that privilege as well, because it is, it is a great thing. And so within these zones, even if you're like little, no company, nothing, you get to, you get to have this choice of that choice of law, which is amazing. But beyond that, um, so what choice of law will do is just like, you're going to say, well, uh, when I, when I write my contracts, we have to, I, I, I'm going to write it so that we follow the laws, uh, the con, the, the, the contract laws of Delaware or of New York or of Texas or whatever. And that makes the uh, interoperability between uh, corporations a lot easier yes. when they follow the same choice of law exactly. or similar known choice of law. Exactly. And that's usually what they will do. And they will look at, uh, before doing business with you or when there's a contract, those things are going to be decided. And even you know when you sign a contract and you say there's a dispute, the the state of Delaware, we're going to yeah. go Delaware, yeah. we're going to go Texas or whatever, that's and right. you sign, yeah. and meaning when there's a dispute, you have to get to that court system. So 
But it's not, but Kevin, it's not because you and I are uh, now, okay, we operate uh, um, Delaware law, we sign our contracts according to Delaware law, we design them to the, according to, it doesn't mean, let's say we're in, a, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, make it up, or in the drug treatment industry. It's not because we are signing contracts along those laws that it means that now I can t- go take my drug and then you say, you and me say, oh, I have this integration, integrative drug, you know, this uh, novelty drug, you have this cancer, there is no hope for you, we think this thing could, could help you. You voluntarily say to me, my God, please, I am desperate. Yeah. This, I did my research, this seems like, you know, a good option for me. I've got nothing to lose at this point. Uh, if I, something doesn't work, I'm gone in the summer. Yeah. I have a friend who's going through that right now, so I speak from that place. Yeah. And, um, right? But you could agree. I could agree. Yeah. But it's, but the FDA doesn't allow it. Yeah. I mean, this is a known thing. I mean, it's, it, it happens today. Yes. I would like, there was a, a great story here about a decade ago where, um, we, we all know the, the late and great Kobe Bryant that passed away. Um, he had a lot of knee related injuries, left the United States, got an experimental stem cell treatment in his knees to re like build the cartilage and, and, and actually improve his game. Couldn't do it in the United States. Yeah. Wasn't FDA. Approved. Probably had to go somewhere in Europe. I found a place in Europe. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so like you're saying like. Yeah. That- so, so then what happens over here? So that part. So the fact that we can sign a contract and we say, you know, we design our contracts according to Delaware law. One thing. Fine. That's great. Because that way I can, av- I can avoid crazy New York laws or whatever. Yes. Depending especially on which, um, you know, on which industry I'm in. Yeah. Crypto but, not good in New York. No, no, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Right. So that's yeah. how you're thinking. You, yes. That's why you, you're choosing your, your, your law, which, which, which that. state type of law. Beyond or, that. Or not even state. It could be which country. That's my point. Yeah. That's, the point. that's why I call it state in this case. State as in country. Yes. Okay. State as in okay, country. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, so you not only have that level. So choice of law is the first one. But then in the case of Prospera, what you also get is case of regulatory. So what it means here is, okay, uh, where we signed in into the Delaware, blah, blah, blah. And then when it comes to the regulatory part, we are going for the OEC, for one of the OECD. So you get to basically from a menu of uh, regulatory, you the, choose which one you're going to choose. This, are you going to go for sure. FDA or are you going to go for uh, something in the OECD uh, zone, you know, with uh, all the European one, J- Japan, Australia? Are you going to go for, because as we, as you know, depending on so, what the drugs or the treatments yes. or whatever, OECD is going to be much more open. That's why Kobe had to go there. Yes. But here at Prospera, right there, you get to decide which regulatory is going to, you're going to be, you're going to accept to be under. Yeah. And it can be the one of a country. If you feel like the one of a country is better than anything else, fine. Uh, like, this is so cool. You see, is that, that choose your own adventure on it, how you want to build your startup? Exactly. So you're right there. And so what is, what is happening is, is a uh, Prospera is attracting some of the most innovative, you know, um, biomedical companies in the world. And actually we, uh, made, um, Bitcoin the legal tender in the zone. And you, you, this is how, you know, when, what's his name? Peter Chow was complaining, like, oh, we wanted 140, we wanted, uh, we wanted, um, what he said, flying cars. And instead we got 140 characters. Yeah. You get 140 characters because primarily because of a regulatory. Primarily because of that. We don't have a flying cars because the regulatory is right. sitting in the way. Totally. Right? Drones, same thing. We haven't gone to where we could have gone just because it stood in the way. This is another example. Drones. Um, one of, uh, one of the most advanced drone companies in the world is called Zipline. Do you know where they had to go and develop Zipline, which by now is also one of the top, um, um, it's not cyber. It's like, um, aerospace type related company now yeah. but they had to go to Rwanda because well, when the West said no way they uh, Rwanda was smart I'm to say I'm an investor in there you go yeah there I, you I go. get it so that's what we're talking so these zones but Rwanda we were just for this one thing but us what we do is when we work with the entrepreneurs to literally for you to have a custom regulatory framework that my friend is unheard of it is just like one of the greatest innovation i think that exists and this really literally has the, ch- the, the chance of changing our civilization as we know it uh, so some people go to mars that's great prepare the place but here there's so much more we can do and most importantly if the west the, if um america doesn't want to get its act together then we're going to give a kick to america all the way from these african nations so what we have been doing so prosper is out there Right now, we're having a struggle with uh, the Honduran government, but uh, I believe Prospera is going to outlive the whole thing. But bottom line is, the cat is out of the bag. It's not going back in. And so in this case, 
Um, I am the co-founder of Prosper Africa, as well as the head of global affairs for um, for uh, public affairs, sorry, for Prosper Global. Yeah. And so I've been taking the Prosper model to Africa. I'm right now speaking to six nations going on to eight. And just to give you example, so some... Uh, the, there's this one country we were so close, so close. The Minister of Economy and Finance was totally on board. Um, we, I mean, all the people who mattered were on board. And then one thing leading to another, we think we got too close to the elections. And then some people almost like want to keep it underneath their arm to, for the project. You know, like they're like, we want to do this, but only when we're on. Anyway, so this journey that I've been on for the past couple of years or so, literally taking this to these African nations and talking to the president, to the ministers and all of that, um, so a few months ago, I was literally um, taken into a black car. At 10 o'clock, they call and they say, at 1 o'clock, you need to be ready. We're going to pick you up in a black car. Uh, no one can come. There's only going to be one person that you know in the car. Because otherwise, I'm like, I'm not going. Yeah. And so they come pick me up in this car and then we, dro- we drive away. And then I arrive in this place where, I kid you not, I believe some people are probably being tortured for reals right now. It's a place that looks like nothing from the outside, looks run down. And then you start walking and then you come in, they take everything from you. you t- they take your, um, they take everything. And so no phone or nothing because, you know, everything. Strip you down and, you know, make sure there's nothing. And then you go in and then I go into this room. If Imagine this one African place. There is no AC, no nothing. The windows, they open. I'm like, why am I opening the window? It's so hot. You know, why not even have a fan? So you had this little dinky fan ob- above me. They sit me on this chair. There's this big room and there's a chair in the middle of a room and I'm sitting in there. I'm the only one sitting on the chair, super uncomfortable. The heat is killing me. Mosquitoes all over the place, just biting me everywhere. Like this. And there's this one guy sitting at this desk. He doesn't even have a computer because none of this information is supposed to go yeah. through the airwaves. And then there's another guy sitting over here. Him, his only job is to watch me and to see if, if I'm lying or not or what I'm going to say. Because basically this president has his own secure, his own secret services next to the secret services. So he, checking on his own people. So he wanted to know what was happening to, to who, who was, because he's trying to know who's trying to sabotage him. And the problem is I can't really lie because if I do, that's the end of for me, not going to kill me or anything, but it's, I'm like, okay, we're not doing business with you or anything. Right. And uh, so I, you have to have a troll truth. Plus, they know everything. They know when you set foot in the, in the country, they probably know who you're seeing oh, because there's spies everywhere. Yes. Anyway, so this pretty much has become a little bit like some of the things that I, that I, that I put myself through. And, uh, but it's a fast, it's a really fascinating work. And, uh, you, in another country, um, it's, uh, it's a situation where the country I'm dealing with could have a lot, uh, has some autonomy, but maybe not the level of autonomy that I need so that we can plug the Prospera, you know, um, platform on it. And then with them, so what you're doing is you're trying to, one of the countries, they're soon about to go for renegotiation of their autonomy from the bigger group that they belong to. So then the job there is to help them figure out what is it that they should ask for so that if when they get it, if they get that, we now can enter, get into action. So it's just a really, uh, really tedious work. Um, yeah, you no have doubt. to look at the president where they're at. But the good news is I am, I, I really think we're very close to announcing something very soon. I'm, I mean, it's what has been exciting for me is the level of interest. I, I did not expect that. I did not expect that. And from, and so that's why when African people are, you know, they're like, oh my God, our leaders are so corrupt. They're never going to accept any of this. I say, you don't understand how we're doing this. A, we're not threatening anything or anybody. Yes. It's all benefits for them. Yes. Once the city is established and starts to make money, they get, they get, I mean, we send money to the, to the, to the main, to the, to the main, uh, to the main uh, government back then. All of this, we work it out with them. It's just a way for them to have a cake and eat it too. And eventually at some point, if this becomes more of a land, the people get to decide on their own. Oh, wow, we want more of this. And then you did it in a way that's really not dis- disruptive or that's destructive right. and a very constructive it's so way. It's sharp to do it that way. You know? You, the other way is just impossible. It's impossible. And so so we do it and what we're seeing is that there's appetite. But what they like about it is that we're not breaking anything. We're not breaking anything. I, I know though they're going to kick us out of this room in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm so glad we, we did this in, in Austin uh, and, and you had the time to sit down with me. Yeah, me too. Thank we, you. We, we should have booked this room for like three hours. <laughs> Going on and on. No problem. Um, I, I do have one question I, w- I want to get to. Well, first of all, there's so much more to unpack here. Where can people go? I mean, they can pick up your book. Yeah. Um, where can people go to, to learn more, educate themselves, and, and actually contribute? Is there a way for people listening to this, and I have mostly US-based listeners, yeah. to actually say, hey, this is meaningful. This matters. What can I do? Yeah. No, definitely. So, you can go to my website, magatwade.com. 
uh, my book Definitive Heart of a Cheetah to really understand all of this and why we're heading the way we're heading. And then also for people to spend time on pros- Prospera.hn, as in Honduras, Prospera.hn. I mean, Eric Berman, Gib Delgado, uh, Nick Dranius, Tom Murcott, I mean, these guys are amazing. We have on our team the ex-CEO as well as the ex-chief strategy officer of the Dubai International Financial Center. We have the top two architects of uh, the um, Estonia e-government, you know, uh, the people who, who are the architects of that. Yes. We have, uh, we work with Zaha Hadid, we, the best, you know, um, what do you call them, architect firm in the world. So it's uh, definitely, it's like a kick-ass team, a kick-ass team of people who really know what they're doing and also come showing up with a, with a heart. We are in this because for me, this is a fighting chance that the poor, the global poor has to leave poverty behind and finally get into prosperity yeah. and live uh, ha- happy, healthy, uh, productive lives. Now, when you say, how can people help? Right now, I am. Um, we have what we call the African uh, Development Fund. The best way to think about it is it's our exploration fund. So this is the fund that allows me to do all of this uh, perspective work that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so that phase is designed to get us to where the country said, yeah, we're on board. The MOU mm-hmm. is here. It's, it's, it's more than an MOU. It's, it has teeth and it's really serious. So when we get there and then from that, so the beauty here is that people who on top of that come into this development fund, the minute I get to sign one of these deals, then you can also come back. And actually be now also an investor. You get right, you know, you can be an investor into um, the, like, now we're building the city. Yeah, now amazing. we're bringing the companies. Uh, the jobs have been created. Everything is happening. So, but we had to do it in, you know, at least in this case, we're doing it in two phases. So that's another way for people to participate as well. For that, of course, you know, would be better to reach out. And uh, so I can walk you through what this entails and how does it work. Um, it's funny because I made a plea to, um, uh, I, 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 I tried to get the attention of someone like Dr., uh, like, uh, Mr. Beast. Cause I'm like, Mr. Beast, come on. And it's, you know, that was so funny, Kevin, because the people of Mr. Beast, I don't think he went to him, but I am not, I'm not giving up. It has to get to Mr. Beast because I know he'll get this. Um, what happened there is his people looked at the proposal. I sent him a little video, you know, explaining the whole thing. And showing that has leg. This is like serious people, serious ideas, serious mm-hmm. everything. I mean, the economists wrote about these things. I mean, this is real. Um, and then his people are like, oh, well, sorry, not this time. We're, we're, we're already doing things with Africa. Just to find out a few weeks later, a couple months later, the whole, I'm sure you saw the big, um, the big viral thing that went around with Mr. Beast, all the Africans complaining because what they did is create all of these wells and bring water, cleaning water. And don't take me wrong. It's bringing water to people is always a good thing, right? It's, you cannot, you cannot criticize that. Yeah. But I'm sitting there and saying, Mr. Beast, should we always just want to just have access to clean water? Or do we want to get to a place where talking about clean water is no longer the problem? And so I, I just wish that, um, they had understood more everything that we're talking about, because yeah. if they had, they totally would have seen like, holy moly, this is, this is the shit. But they didn't get it, but people yeah. will, people will. So that's how people can participate. Last question for you. Um, Clearly, is, is someone that is has been traveled traveled all over, educated themselves all over the world. Um, who are, who are your mentors? How did you how how did you become this entrepreneur? How did you educate yourself? Like, wh- how did you you know it it, it takes um, it it takes someone that's willing to fail and get back up again. It takes someone that's a lifelong learner. Um, to ask questions when they don't know the right answers. What, 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 um, well, how does someone become like you? <laughs> I don't know if I'm, uh, if I'm some, someone to emulate or anything like that, but I, but I definitely do pride myself in the fact that I, I don't accept the status quo. That's, that for me is very easy. I think at the end of the day, um, it's very important to try, you know, yesterday I was interviewing somebody for my podcast and I uh, asked him this question and I don't think he was used to being asked this question. I said, when it's all said and done, what do you want to see on your tombstone? Mm. And, you know, it goes back to what is your, your, pur- your mission and purpose. Mm-hmm. I think when you ask people that question, it helps them elevate be- beyond, above and beyond all the mundanities of, of life. You try to, it, it forces you to try and re- remember in the end, in the end, um, why, why were you here? What's your tombstone what going to be? My tombstone, 2.5 billion Africans getting into prosperity by 2050. I want for Africans in our lifetime to achieve prosperity and to be recognized as global co-creators of innovation and prosperity. 
And I know. You can't do that alone. So is, no. is this mentors? So the way I learned, so no. So yeah, so I have so many mentors. How do you land a mentor? How do you land someone like you, you want to you, you list your roster of people that are involved? Yes, yes. These are household names. Yes, yes. These are people that yes. like would, people would die yeah. to get in front of. Yes, yes. How did you open those doors? In my Yes, yeah, so... How did I open those doors? I think what you do is you be very clear about what your goal is. And again, um, don't criticize, just criticize by creating. So that's the big thing. Criticize by creating. Be, be very clear. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be a goal. It just, but it can just be a dream, but it has to be serious. You have to be serious about it. And it, and it, and it needs to be, uh, well articulated. And then from there, you put yourself out there. You, you really put yourself out there. I've, my whole life, I've put myself out there. I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem asking for help. I think, I think humility is very important. I'm very, I'm, I'm very strongly opinionated. But you know what? Um, Kevin, I accepted that about me. You have to accept who you are. Work with who you are. Put yourself out there the way you are. Don't try to BS people. Don't try to be something that you're not. What you have to have faith in is you are what you are. And maybe not everybody's going to love you or like you or even care about you or even be moved by you, but there will always be some that will be. And those are the ones you're looking mm-hmm. for. And, um, and, but those cannot come to you if you don't open the door for them. Mm-hmm. So, and I tell people also, do you really want to be, um, do you really want to attract people based on something that's not a hundred percent you? Yeah. Do you? So my answer would be put your, know what you want. And sometimes even if the problem is, I don't know what I want, mm-hmm. but I am here. I want to find my, 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 my purpose and my meaning. It's okay if that's where you are, but say it, say it mm. and try to give something to work with, um, about who you are, what you're interested in. And you can say, and, and I am after meaning and purpose. I think meaning and purpose really matters to people because pe- nobody is interested in just making you more rich or making right. you more beautiful or whatever. It's like in the goal of what? Right. Right. So if it's in the pursuit of money, it, it, it's the, you'll you'll when times get tough as they inevitably will, you, you bail. You bail because there's no there's no there's no internal passion or drive or that's conviction. Right. That's right. What you're trying. To that's do. right. That's right. But there are some there are a few names that I want to that I want to give, and I I yes. know it's so terrible because there's. I'm going to give free so I don't overwhelm people. And then any a couple books that maybe yeah, you but there's inspired yeah. by. Absolutely. So I'm going to give a, uh, the three top people in my life right now, um, four, because one of them is gone, but man, she was everything. But there's a hundred more behind all of these people. So everybody that I'm not going to say your names, don't be offended. It's just because. So the first one is my husband, Michael Strong, right? If when you discover his background, you will know why. It's not one of those situations. Oh, I want to thank my husband. Yeah. You'll, you'll know why. A real partner. Oh, 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 yes. He, he's, I, I can he's, see he's in doing, your eyes. He's doing the Lord's work. I love that. He's doing the Lord's work on his, in his own right. Um, so there's Michael Strong, and then there's John Mackey, co-founder of Whole Foods Market, and then there's Jordan, um, there's uh, Vidar Jorgensen, um, the very quiet man behind someone like uh, um, Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize um, for peace and invented, you know, the Grameen, the Grameen, uh, phones, uh, idea and all of that stuff. So beyond, um, those guys is the woman who in my mind started it all. And she remains, uh, um, she remains a, a mentor even from her grave, but it's my grandmother. Hmm. Uh, so people who read the book will know why. And so those really are the people who are my greatest mentors right now. Uh, it's not just right now, it's, it's been like that. And also these mentors have been with me through thick and thin. Um, they saw, they saw my potential when I think no one else did. Mm. They saw my potential and they believed in it even when I didn't. Mm. Starting with my grandma, who when I was very tiny, she would say, Oh, baby, I, in your eyes, I can see the universe. And I, I know she believed what it. That's a beautiful thing. Isn't it? Yeah. So that was that. And then, um, in terms of books, um, obviously, I really feel like everybody should definitely read Michael's book. It's called Be the Solution, How Entrepreneurs and Conscious Capitalists Can Solve All the World Problems. Mm. So talking about entrepreneurship and really, you know, remembering... It's called Be the Solution? Be the Solution. Okay. And then um, there is also um, all the books from uh, Professor Sowell, Thomas Sowell. I love He's all down. of his books. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And um, so those, and and my last one, this is also a mentor of mine, um, Professor George Ayite. We have we lost him early last year, but uh, his book Africa Unchained is 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 a masterpiece, a masterpiece. George is the reason why I started looking where where I have been looking. George is the reason why many people think I'm an economist when I'm not, but because I, I geek out on these things. But um, yes, he 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 he. George really deserves. I'm I'm standing on his shoulders. I'm I'm literally standing on the shoulders of George. And one day, it's part of a work I'm doing. One day, George's name will be part of a history box about Africa. He is the one who saw something that no one else saw in times when it was very dangerous to even go there. He had his office bombed, all that stuff. He took so many errors on his back. But I'm not going to let those errors go to waste. So I'm carrying that ball. And that's why I called the book The Heart of a Cheetah. Because George, in 2007, remember when I told you my first time at TED, the first TED yeah. Africa, George was on stage. And there I was, imagine, eyes were bright open. I was just coming to the world. And uh, George had this call, talk of his talk called, the um, it was called Cheetahs versus Hippos. And uh, he was talking about these hippos. He's saying it's all more like a mentality. It's not so much about your age or whatever. But the hippo mentality are the ones who sold out Africa, whether it's our leaders, you know, all the people who are involved into this power grab that's left us where we are. He said, those are the hippos. But he said, but all my hopes and my bets for Africa lies on your backs, you cheetahs. And he said, we were the cheetahs. I was part of his original cheetahs. And he said, you are the fast runners of Africa. You are the people who will wait for no one. You wait for no one. You wait for nothing. You mm. are our only hope. And he said, run, cheetahs, run. And run, we will. I, I got I to gotta write that TED Talk down now as well. We'll link all this up in the yeah. show notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send it to you. So, uh, my guy, from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being on this show. Thank, thank you, you for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, you are, it's so clear to me that you're one of the good ones. You're driven from a place of... of of courage and and wanting to change the world and make it better, which uh, is just an inspiration to us. Trying to, trying to. Yeah. Thank you.